Hi everybody, so my name is Amal Probably you're not going to remember my class. I'm in biophysics, biochemistry, and Beckman across the street. And actually what we do in my lab is essentially trying to get a molecular view of how things work in our, in our body. So it's like, have you seen magic school bus? This is really like that. We want to take a trip to the molecular world and see how things are happening at that scale. I don't know if you want to make a guess what I'm showing here. Anybody wants to make a guess? It's a hurricane? <laughs> no, these are actually two membranes. I mean, one of them is a virus membrane, a viral membrane. The other one is a host cell membrane. And that's how the virus approaches the host cell, trying to establish connection between the two membranes in order to get into the host cell. This, these are the proteins that are involved in viral infection. In, essentially. And we want to understand how this happens, and if we understand that, of course, we can fight viral infection, for example, better. But actually, that's what we do in the lab. We want to get a molecular picture at atomic scale of how things happen. And this is one example. Not only do we want to have a molecular detailed view of how things happen, we want to have a dynamical picture of things. Because, as you know, molecules move all the time. If they don't move, they can't do their function. If, if they freeze you, you are going to die here. So we need to have moving molecules in order to be able to see their function. So why do we care about having a molecular view? I guess the most important aspect is that we are all curious. We want to understand what, how things happen in nature. That's the curiosity that is in all of us. That's the main reason. We want to really have a deeper understanding of how things happen. At the same time, if we understand how these molecules work, we can develop much better drugs, much more selective drugs that don't have much side effects for many diseases. And we can less learn from the lessons that nature gives us, because nature has been doing this for millions of years now. So they have, nature has actually designed highly optimized machines. And if you can learn the principles in those machines, we might be able to use those principles to design better technology for, for our own life. Yeah. So that's the idea. So here, I, I'm actually trying to show you a few examples of the kind of molecular processes that we are also studying in the lab. So this one is a transporter that is supposed to transport the sugar molecule shown here from one side of the membrane outside the cell into the cell, and as you can see, it's a, like an elevator taking the sugar from one side of the membrane into its binding side and bringing it to the other side of the membrane. So that's one example. So how can we do this? How can we take this detailed view of how molecules function? These are some experiments that actually we can do in order to get some information. But as you can see, if you look at the type of information you can get from these experiments, if you do molecular biology experiment, you get some positive or negative results from your experiments. You can do much fancier biophysical measurements like nuclear magnetic resonance type of experiment. You get a bunch of dots like this. X-ray diffraction that is used to characterize the structure of proteins gives you data like this. And some other experiments simply gives you some plots and curves. So nothing really can give you a molecular model of how things happen. You really rely for complex systems on computers to convert all this data to a molecular image, a molecular view that is more understandable from our perspective. And that's exactly what we do. We rely on supercomputers. We have the blue waters right on this campus, as many of you know. And we use these very, very powerful machines to convert this raw experimental data to molecular images, real molecular pictures of how things are, which is much easier to understand. Okay, if I ask you what is this, do you think it's an open protein or a closed protein? Even I can't say. Probably there are two people on this campus who might tell you that. But if you look at this, you can see how they are moving and how this motion can be connected to the function. This is really the idea, to get a really detailed view of the protein and how it moves. I would like to emphasize that aspect. This is not trivial to get from many experiments. So how are we going to do that? I guess we followed sort of famous scientist, Newton, that, who was interested in following the motion of planets, right? And uh, we have the famous sort of equation here. If you know the forces acting on 
the mass, you can calculate the acceleration. You can essentially predict how planets move in space. So we, if you know these rules, then you can essentially have a trajectory of these planets. We are doing exactly the same thing with one difference. So Newton was working on planets initially, and we are going to work on atoms. So we have exactly the same kind of rules. So if you can somehow define the interaction between these atoms, what kind of forces they act upon each other, then we should be able to calculate how they move in space. And that's exactly what we do. There is one problem here. The problem here is actually, yes, this is one example of the kind of sort of trajectories of the kind of motions that you might get. This is how water molecules make it from one side of the membrane to the other side. I'm not showing the membrane. There are proteins that are involved in this process. These are water channels. Water cannot easily cross the membrane, so you need to have a special channels for it. And as you can see, it's a very random process. It's not just like one molecule zooming through. So you have a lot of back and forth motion. These are the thermal motion of molecules that we have everywhere. And that's the most detailed picture that you can see. We, I've opened the protein, you can see what happens inside the protein, why it is so narrow, why other things cannot go through it, because they are too big, and they get stuck here. So water is the only thing that makes it through. This movie made it to the Nobel Prize website. I, I guess I, I always joke that this is probably the closest I get to the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> but that's good. <laughs> So this is, uh, this is the type of picture we want to give. But actually, as you can imagine, even such a small system, a single protein that we can't even see with our naked eyes includes many, many atoms. And that makes things very, very difficult in terms of calculation. I just wanted to say, first of all, atoms move very, very fast. We are talking about motions on a picosecond or a femtosecond time scale. That's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And second of all, we have a lot of them. You know the Avogadro's number, right? So even in a mole, in a very small sort of amount of matter, you have a lot of atoms. And as I told you, we have to calculate the forces between all these atoms. That's a very, very expensive kind of calculation. For this reason, actually, first of all, because atoms move very fast, in this type of calculations, which are known as molecular dynamic simulations, so we have to take a very, very short time step, one femtosecond, that's 15, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So every 10 to the minus 15 seconds, we have to calculate the interaction between all the atoms in the system. So you can imagine how expensive this kind of calculation is. And for these reasons, we are really limited in terms of the time scale. The, even for a microsecond, that's 10 to the minus 6 seconds, which is nothing we have to calculate all these forces a billion times. So these are very expensive kind of calculation, but they give you the most detailed view of how things happen. And of course, for this, we rely on supercomputers. I think, fortunately, almost every five years or so, we have had about a factor of 10 increase in the power of these computational resources that we have. And without this, it would be impossible to do these kind of calculations. So as you can see from, this was 12 processors in 1993. That was the largest cluster available back then. Probably your iPad is more powerful than this machine now. Then we have 120, 3,000, 60,000. This is a specialized machine. Don't worry about this. But now we have actually blue waters here on the campus, which at least 200,000 processors. So with these kind of computational resources, we can calculate all the forces, and we can really describe the natural motion of the molecules very well. So just give you a couple of examples of the kind of biological phenomena that we study in the lab. So this is, don't worry about the details, but this is what is known as the coagulation cascade, how the blood forms clots when you cut yourself. So usually you have everything circulating in your blood, but you don't form clot, and that's good because then otherwise we're going to have a stroke and cardiac infarction and all sorts of problems. It's good. We have all the proteins, but they don't activate each other. And the reason is that they have to detect certain types of lipids on the surface of the membrane. This is a representation of the membrane of a cell. And usually you see these clotting proteins are circulating in the in plasma. This is your blood without reacting with the membrane. As soon as we have certain types of lipids, which are usually inside the cell, if they get exposed, these black guys, 
if they get exposed to the surface, now these proteins bind to the surface of the membrane. They find each other on the surface of the membrane and they activate each other and the whole casket starts and you form clots. So really, if you want to design a good drug against coagulation, which is in great need in the clinic, if you understand how they bind to the surface of the membrane, then you can go there and design a drug exactly for that spot, very selective kind of drug. And that's the, an example of the process that we want to simulate. So this is, this is actually our protein, the coagulation protein, and that's the surface of the membrane, very complex. But don't worry about that. We want to see how it binds to the membrane, how deep it goes into the membrane, and what kinds of interactions are responsible for this one. And I can tell you that experimentally, it's impossible to calculate this, or to measure this, I should say, because it's, it's a very fluid environment. It's very difficult. So this is now a result of a calculation, simulation, in which you can see actually that the protein sort of spends some time, takes its time, tumbles around a little bit, and this is actually a typical representation of motion of molecules. They, they are not directed. Everything is random at that level. They keep actually trying different penetration, and then at the end, as you can see, it nicely inserts into the membrane and inserts. You can see these are the calcium ions that are necessary for coagulation. If you, are, if you do some biology experiment, if you don't have calcium, you can't form blood clot. And this is the reason, because the calcium is necessary for this protein to bind to the surface of the membrane. So once we have the membrane bound form of this, once we know how it is sitting in the membrane, now we can actually design a drug that prevents the interaction between these lipids. These are the lipids in the membrane and our protein very, very specifically. Another example is actually binding of a signaling protein. It's a very similar kind of process, but here we also have actually conformation or structural changes of the protein in response to the membrane. Like if I'm the protein, as soon as I see the membrane, I come down here and then change my conformation on the surface. And this motion is actually the signaling mechanism. So you can see, I mean, it's like you have a computational, you have a microscope that gives you a very molecular image. At the same time, you see the motion. This is impossible to do experimentally. But fortunately, thanks, thanks to supercomputing centers, thanks to the technology of these simulation algorithms that are very efficient, we are able to see and describe these detailed processes. And finally, this is an example of a binding of a drug, or ATP, or nucleotide, whatever, to a protein. So you can see actually what kind of response you can expect from the protein. So this could be an ATP, could be a drug. Initially, you can see the protein side chains. These are the sort of details of the protein. They are separate from each other, and once this molecule binds, you can see that it sort of changes the conformation of the protein. It's, this is how drugs activate the protein, activate the receptor, for example, or inhibit the receptor. So we, again, as you can see, we can see exactly what happens, how, how much the, the, the drug has to struggle before it really penetrates deeply into the binding site. But then once you have that, you know the participation of certain amino acids in the binding of this, what happens if you mutate, what happens if you have a mutation at this site? Maybe your binding goes away, and we can understand the molecular basis of certain diseases very, very well. And finally, I would like to leave you with a couple of important remarks that, that the take-home messages, first of all. All the molecules move all the time, even at zero degrees Kelvin. Everything is moving, and if we don't have this motion, if we don't take into account this motion, we can't have a complete picture of how molecules function, especially in biology. So we have to be able to describe the dynamics of these molecules at atomic detail in order to have a deep understanding of how they move and how they do what they are doing in human body, in materials, in nature. And then computational modeling currently offers a very powerful and, and unparalleled, if you compare it to experiment, method to achieve uh, such a detailed description of, of molecules. So these are some of the important key points that I would like you to remember at least from this. And I hope I gave you a sort of flavor of what kind of computational modeling we can do, what kind of processes we can study, and what it takes to study these processes. 
Any questions? So we are uh, uh, funded by National Science Foundation, NSF, to uh, provide a program for high schoolers outreach to learn about uh, this kind of uh, simulations or, or experiments about nanotechnology in general. So uh, we'd like you to be uh, involved in this and we have like summer opportunities if you are 15 and above I guess, you have to be 15 years at least to, to work with us. Mm -hmm. And there's some program on campus or you can even work within your high school. We can help you, we can sponsor certain activities on campus to work with you. So this is a five years project, we started this year, we have another four years after this. And uh, our contact is uh, Mr. Stone, if you have any questions, please talk to him and then we will, we will talk to them. Okay, and, and as opportunities uh, start to gel, uh, I'll be sending stuff out, out, out to people. Yeah. So we're, yeah. we're looking at, at a variety of different uh, uh, opportunities occurring. And, yeah. and Professor Imad Taj Khurshid is one of our senior personnel, so he's helping us also. We'll have many people coming with similar things, give you ideas. If you like to, to, to listen to someone on campus, so you like to see their work, we can bring them over, we can facilitate that. that uh, that's possible. So this is really a research at the interface of biology, computer science, physics, so engineering, so that, I mean any interest in any of these areas we can really accommodate in, in the lab. Great. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, very much. <laughs> Piece of the protein moving down. <laughs> That's my proof that everything was moving. But, but because actually it made it to the Nobel Prize website, I didn't want to. So I'm still using the original. <laughs> good eyes. Good eyes. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh,